Hi, I'm Natalie. Welcome to session three of Hyper Annotations at Ocean Space in Venice, making sense of the 58th Venice Biennale. We're here with Philippe Pirot, the director of the Städelschule and Porticus in Frankfurt, and most recently curator of Arus Malik, the uh, exhibition that's taking place now at the Center for Contemporary Art, Singapore. Philippe is also uh, was on the selection committee of the next documenta. So Rangu Grupa was selected, an artist collective from Indonesia, to curate the next uh, documenta edition. So perhaps Philippe, hi. hi. Um, would you like to start by telling us a little bit about this exhibition that you worked on about the ocean, um, since we're here at Ocean Space, which uh, is very interested in research around the ocean. Yeah. Yes, Arus Balik is a, an exhibition that is based on a book by an Indonesian author called Pramudi Anantatur, and it translates as The Turning of the Tide, and it's a book that is an historical novel taking place in the 16th century in the Indonesian archipelago, and it's trying to find, it's some sort of soul-searching, trying to find uh, the reason that uh, the Portuguese were able to colonize certain parts of uh, Indonesian islands and later on the Dutch. And Pramudia locates that in uh, the kind of like the problem of the sultanates, the maritime kingdoms uh, on the archipelago, uh, that started to quarrel amongst themselves and looking more inward in Java, for example, than um, continuing like uh, controlling the seas. So it's kind of like a, a mental shift in. Uh, in, in the mentality of, of the maritime kingdoms in the 16th century, um, taking more importance or giving more importance to what happens on the land and uh, starting to see the sea as a border instead of as a continuation. So Arus Balik means the turning of the tide. The turning of the tide is like the turning of a, it's a metaphor for uh, the turning of power also. The powers coming from the north uh, are starting to control the archipelago instead of the powers of the archipelago itself. And that's why the, the show also is entitled, next to Aris Balik, it's called From Below the Wind to Above the Wind and Back Again. Referring to the monsoons that were used uh, by the countries below the wind, how they call themselves, um, and that the power shifts to the countries above the wind, which is uh, coming from the Arab world and Europe uh, in that time, in the 16th century. So it's a, it starts with the fall of Malacca uh, in 1521. And we worked with uh, six artists uh, to reflect on that book by Pramudia, um, to take it as a starting point. Some of them could read it, some of them not, because it's not translated into English. But it was a very interesting kind of like uh, conversation amongst artists with me and uh, and amongst each other um, to reflect on this uh, historical moment in which the sea is very important but uh, is also kind of like the, uh, the location of a of a shift of power that's fantastic thank you for that answer it's incredible to think about this exhibition also in the context of Venice itself as a series of islands all connected together mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. thinking about the origin of the Biennale itself I keep coming back to this but as a the national pavilions with an impetus of nationalism mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. at a time at the end of the 19th century when of course nationalism and growing pride in your nation was becoming mm -hmm. very very important um, and the the way that biennials have evolved throughout the 20th century and into the 21st is very interesting um, especially considering mm -hmm. that now with the advent of the internet and multi-platform channels mm -hmm. we can it, it, there's a decentralization going on for mm -hmm. art at large. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the decentralization of the art world, mm -hmm. how you think, whether you think there's a future for a mega exhibition like Venice to be taking place in Venice, and and where you see, where you can see an exhibition going like this. I would like to go back to your initial uh, coining of the term nationalism and I think it's a, it's interesting of course it's easy to take nationalism as a uh, as a notion to be criticized nowadays and and I and it's totally legitimate to criticize it because we we witness a, a re 
um, re-emergence of, of problematic nationalisms. But I think it's important to unpack the term and, and, and look at it uh, from, from other perspectives too. Like nationalisms are imagined communities and that's the, the title of this book by Benedict Anderson and were very important, for example, in uh, struggles for independence of certain countries. It's kind of like trying to re-imagine another nationalism um, towards the colonial powers, for example, and that was very important to, to create this type of imagined communities and, to, and some of those nationalisms are also very inclusive instead of exclusive. Of course, nowadays in Europe, for sure, we, we live this moment uh, where certain nationalisms emerge that become extremely exclusive, which is totally unnatural to how uh, communities are built. Communities are built with the differences in them uh, by default and, and I think that's it's very important to maybe kind of like instead of like just saying we criticize nationalism is to kind of like maybe also look at how can we think nationalism differently that could maybe be an answer to today's problematic nationalism and to reread um, this fantastic book by, by Benedict Anderson, The Imagined Communities. Mm -hmm. And of course we always make imagined communities. The art world is an imagined community. We share, you know, it's an imagined community is a community in which values are shared and exchanged. And, and I think Oh, mega exhibitions are, I think they're extremely important as places to meet. Um, it's also easy to criticize those, the, the, the Biennales, etc. But let's say if you look at it in, in a global perspective, Biennales are extremely important as also uh, surrogate institutions in places where institutions are maybe lacking or not built or developed well enough or um, not that they are inexistent but that they are um, not having, let's say, the same infrastructure as in some other places in the world. So I think biennales are, are a very important, like let's for example in Indonesia where I was involved in the last Jakarta Biennale, it was a very important moment to also reflect on what institutional work would be necessary, for example. And also not to copy it from, from the West, but just to look at it from another perspective. So I think these also in Venice, the location is of course historically uh, kind of like it gives an affect to it, absolutely. But I think it's in, an, an important moment to to exchange different perspectives uh, on what culture and art could be. Um, of course, it becomes. I see. I see it much more problematic uh, what it becomes on a commercial level uh, than the nationalisms. I think. Of course, there is national pavilions, and some of them turn that inside out, others don't. Uh, it's a ritual of two years, meaning it's very fast that it comes back, that one can react on the next one, or on, sorry, the former one, mm -hmm. the next one can mm -hmm. react again on the one before. It can happen within the pavilions. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, and a lot of the pavilions indeed are not real. It, it, it is a problem when the countries and the commissioners exploit it as a means of uh, promoting a certain national identity, which is most of the time very ridiculous. Um, but I think most of the, the projects now also reflect on that in, in problematizing it or in making it more inclusive or, or thinking it differently, etc. Then again, there is the danger of reification again, you know, that it becomes a fetishism of, of, uh, of showing how inclusive mm -hmm. a society is, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's part of the game, you know, of the ritual, and it, mm -hmm. it changes. I think, as I said, more problematic is that the Biennale becomes like a big art fair. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, Venice Biennale is, as everybody knows, not enormously well financed as a Biennale, the, the main exhibition. So each time the curator has to find solutions in order to add money or to bring more money to it. And, and indeed, the, the, the most easy solution is always to turn to the gallerists and the collectors. And meaning that more and more this Biennale becomes a place where uh, the space as an extended gallery space for, for many of the big powerhouses uh, of the New York, Hong Kong galleries, so to say. Um, and I think that's much more, that is more problematic than, than I think the reflection on and the discourse on nationalism is 
made much more complex over the years. And, and in that sense, this whole problematic national pavilions, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, of course, it's, it's coming out of another era. Mm -hmm. um, but we, curatorially and artistically, that is dealt with, I think, in, in an often very interesting way. Wow. Can we, in one line or a quick minute, um, talk about what we can expect from Rangrupa? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no. For 2022 documentary. No, that's, it's, it's, their, it's, their uh, it's their thing. It's, uh, that's what they're going to develop. Yeah. I, we don't know. We, the, the, the commission who selected them, we were eight people and we selected them unanimously. Mm. Um, trusted them because I think that's the only thing I can say. They advanced a method instead of a concept. A method instead a method of a concept. And it's that's a method important. that is very much maybe a, cri a criticism, it's not, but it's kind of like an alternative to this uh, gallery and collectors infused uh, programming. You know, like uh, it's, a, it's another, another way of organizing um, and I, I think they will they will look at, at can can such an exhibition or such a project be organized in a different way looking away from this speculative uh, financialized art world and, and I think that that's probably the reason why the committee in the end uh, thought that, that this could be a, a game changer. Fantastic. Thank you, Philippe, for your Thank time. You very much. Yeah. Let's talk more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Razan.